Hello and welcome. Tonight, UNICEF express worry over continued violation of rights of children nine years after 276 girls were abducted from Chibok Girls Secondary School in Borno State. We will be joined on the news at 10 by the UNICEF country representative in Nigeria, Ms. Christiane Mondwate, on issues of rights violation. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, begins distribution of sensitive materials ahead of Saturday's supplementary elections. And Governor Hope Uzo Dimma emerges governorship candidate for the All Progressives Congress in Imo State after the party's primary. On business news tonight, Central Bank Governor Mr. Godwin MFLA to continue with his monetary policies as he renews efforts at curbing inflation. He was speaking today at the IMF World Bank Spring Meeting in Washington, D.C. And on sports news tonight, Michaela Teta says Arsenal will need luck in the right moment if they are going to finish as Premier League champions above rampant Manchester City. From Abuja, the Pension Transitional Arrangement Directorate, PITAD, officially launches I Am Alive platform, a website-based confirmation solution for verified pensioners. And in international news from London, a 21-year-old US airman has appeared in court in connection with a leak of highly classified military documents about the Ukraine. It's exactly nine years now after 276 schoolgirls were abducted in the middle of the night from their dormitory in Chibok, Nigeria. Sadly, up till date, 96 girls remain in captivity and thousands more of children have been subjected to grave violations of their rights. And this is of great concern to the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, as it puts out a reminder today that not much has changed after that heinous incident as there are still reports of abduction of schoolgirls and violation of rights of school children. So, what is UNICEF advocating? It wants safety of children in Nigerian schools, of course. It is collaborating with government on that, and the target is to invest 144 billion naira. In its statement today, UNICEF says it's ready to support the Nigerian government in its implementation of the initiative to ensure that all children encountered in the cause of armed conflict in Nigeria or released from armed groups are quickly reunited with their families. UNICEF equally says it's committed and stands with the Nigerian government to ensure that every child in Nigeria can enjoy their rights and live in a peaceful and prosperous society. Since 2014, there have been over 2,400 incidents of grave violations verified affecting over 6,800 children in the Northeast. Recently, 80 children were reportedly abducted by militants in Zamfara State, Safe local government area, according to local media. This reinforces the urgent need for action to protect children in Nigeria. And of course, um, and of course, uh, moving on, uh, we have a background on that. Well, the news of the Chibok girls, of the abduction of the Chibok girls in 2014, not only shook the authorities, but the entire nation. Well, it also attracted international condemnation and indeed outrage. In this report, we take you back to that story of the abduction of the girls and how that has led to the Safe School Initiative. On the night of April the 14th, 2014, 276 female students aged from 16 to 18 were kidnapped by the terrorist group Boko Haram from a government girls' secondary school in Chibok in Borno State, Nigeria. 57 of the schoolgirls escaped immediately following the incident by jumping from the trucks in which they were being transported and others have been rescued by the Nigerian armed forces on various occasions. <laughs> the 
Hopes have been raised that the remaining girls might be released. But four years after the Chibak abduction, on February the 19th, 2018, 110 schoolgirls aged between 11 to 19 years were kidnapped by Boko Haram terrorist group from the Government Girls Science and Technical College Dapchi in Busuri local government area of Yobe State, northeast Nigeria. <laughs> The federal government of Nigeria deployed the Nigerian Air Force and other security agencies to search for the missing schoolgirls and hopefully enable their return. Five of the girls died on the same day they were kidnapped. Boko Haram released everyone else in March 2018, except for Leah Sharibu, who is still in captivity. Only for the Musta president to assist and put more effort to fulfill his promise that this my daughter will be released. The abductions in Chibok and Dapchi in 2014 and 2018 reverberated across the globe with several people raising awareness on the need to have a safe teaching and learning environment in schools nationwide. This development gave birth to the Safe Schools Initiative, launched at the World Economic Forum in Africa in Nigeria by a coalition of Nigerian business leaders working with the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education and the former British Prime Minister, Mr. Gordon Brown, the Global Business Coalition for Education and the World at School. It's our determination as an international community to help uh, the families feel secure about their girls and boys going to school with the hope that they will be safe. And that's why we are looking at security for the schools and how we can help the governor and how we can help the Nigerian people. Uh, fortifications, telecommunications, guards, safety equipment that will enable people to feel more secure about the schools. We also want to help the rebuilding of Chibok School because we want parents in that area to be sure that when their girls are released, they can come home to a school that is rebuilt and safe. According to Nigeria's former Minister of Finance, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, $20 million was raised by the federal government and the private sector as an initial capital. Mr. President has kicked off this initiative by opening and instructing that I open a trust fund, which has already uh, we put 1.6 billion naira into it. The private sector is also putting 1.6 billion naira. With over 10 million children out of school in Nigeria and some in schools in the northeast region ravaged by insurgency beginning to lose interest in education after series of attacks on schools by the terrorist group Boko Haram, seeking an end to Western education, the federal government says Nigerian children must have an environment where they could come back to school and not have anyone truncate their education. Right, for more on this, I'm now being joined by the UNICEF country representative in Nigeria, Ms. Christiane Munduate, on the News at 10. As she joins us from Abuja. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I think this is a very concerning uh, problem that uh, has to be as part of the priorities, not only of the national and federal authorities, but also for the entire Nigerian society. Right. So let's start off. It's been nine years indeed since the abduction of 276 schoolgirls from the Chibo Girls Secondary School in Borno State in Nigeria's northeast, of course. Even now, there are still over 90 of them in captivity still. It would appear an average Nigerian child from the north is finding it difficult to attend school without fear of safety. So let me ask you, how is the Safe School Initiative and the partnership with the Nigerian government helping to rebuild confidence among young people? Yes, so we have a, a very strong joint work with the federal government, with different uh, partners, and uh, we include uh, UNICEF as well. But uh, the important part is also including local communities. And uh, we joined forces to adopt uh, durable solutions to keep the, safe, uh, the safety of schools in the northeast, northwest, and central parts of the country. So up to today, 
Okay, Please go today, ahead. 100,000 children uh, were displaced from their homes in uh, Nigeria by Boko Haram, as you rightly said before. So we have set uh, several safe school initiative uh, interventions, such as um, the student transfer program. This means to transfer students that are in high risk areas to schools that are in a safer part of the country. The second intervention is the school reconstruction program to develop physical protection infrastructure and uh, to develop security plans. We have done this in collaboration with the UK's Department of International Development, the uh, Nigerian Army Engineer Corps, well, uh, and both of them have worked in risk profiles for schools. We have developed emergency plans so that uh, this also is being managed at school level. Uh, one, one of the points that are really important as well is the provision of innovative education strategies and materials for children living in internally displaced camps. Here, UNICEF works with the federal and the state government to provide education to children living in host communities. Lastly, I would like to add that in December 2022, the federal government launched uh, 144.8 million nairas, billion nairas uh, for the safe school financing plan. And this uh, gives us hope so we can go and start scaling up this initiative as unfortunately there are many schools that are at risk and that where children are unsafe. All right. Um, Permit me, to, yeah. permit me to come in there very quickly. Uh, you talked about schools financing uh, a while ago. Now. Permit me to ask, how does UNICEF actually uh, intend to uh, support government in the area of schools financing, or what is UNICEF doing in that regard? Yeah, um, so we provide, first of all, I think this is one of uh, the most uh, important part of, of UNICEF cooperation is the technical assistance we provide. We have experts in the area. We have a long-standing um, capacity on education and on child protection. And if we are talking about uh, numbers and funds, uh, we have, uh, uh, in the past five years, we have contributed with over 41 billion nairas, which accounts to more or less 88.4 uh, million dollars. So it has been a very important contribution thanks to the governments, uh, uh, the bilateral cooperation and many governments internationally that have helped us to uh, bring these funds so we can work in the Bay States. All right, we'll definitely leave it at that. Ms. Christian Monduate, UNICEF country representative in Nigeria. We thank you for your thoughts on the News at 10. Thank you, thank you. In part two, after the break, preparations for tomorrow's supplementary elections in Top Gear as Arnick distributes sensitive materials. Do join us again. candidate for the All Progressives Congress in Emo State after the party's primary. And 21-year-old U.S. airman appears in court with a leak of highly classified documents on Ukraine war and other national security issues. As we all know, Banditry is yet to abate in the country. And just today, 
Police operatives in Katsina killed two terrorists in a gun duel in Danmark village in Dagrawa district, Kurfi local government area of the state. According to the police, several others escaped with various gunshot wounds during the encounter with police patrol teams in Katsina state. The incident occurred earlier today after a distress call was received by the police that terrorists in their numbers were shooting sporadically using AK-47 rifles attacking the residence of one Serkin Fulani. Consequently, the divisional police officer in charge of Kurfi Division led police patrol teams to the area, engaged the hoodlums into a fierce gun duel and successfully repelled them. In the course of scanning the scene, two bandits were neutralized and all the rustled cows recovered. In a statement released by the police spokesman, CSP Gambo Isa, he explains that many of the terrorists are reasonably believed to have been neutralized and that others escaped the scene with gunshot wounds. He added that the command is appealing to members of the communities around the area to report to the nearest police station any person found or seen with a suspected injury. Corporate organizations, particularly well-meaning individuals, have been urged to assist the police in providing adequate security in the ancient town of Owo in Undo State. The paramount ruler of the kingdom, His Royal Majesty Ajibadi Ogoye, stated this while speaking at the occasion of a presentation of vehicles to the Nigerian police. The vehicles donated by some indigents of our kingdom residing in the United States of America are meant to be used by the police for patrol in Owo and its environs. Before now, there was a terrorist attack in Owo in June 2022 at a St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in which over 40 worshippers were killed and several others injured. The paramount ruler of our kingdom, the Olowo of Owo, Ajibadi Ogwe, commends the donors, noting that the vehicles would be used judiciously. After the, the dastardly attack, uh, during my discussion with the president, the immediate past president of the World Council of our Asian United States, I informed him about the security challenge that we are facing, facing there. Particularly, uh, lack of mobility for the Nigerian police. Because uh, be before the attack, I, 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 I was aware about, about the problem. So I made a request to our sons and daughters in the United States to help us uh, to provide vehicles for the Nigerian police so that they will be able to move when necessary at, uh, at the appropriate time to face uh, any security challenge around there. So thereafter, uh, our children, that is the, our sons and daughters in, in, the, in the U.S., uh, started discussing and uh, eventually uh, they made efforts and, uh, and they, they informed me that they were bringing vehicles to us. I requested for two vehicles, parallelly, one for the A Division and another for the B Division. And today they brought forth uh, around. So uh, we therefore invited the police for, for, for the, after the unveiling to present them the, uh, the two, two of the vehicles, that is one for the A Division and one for the, for the B Division, to enhance security around there. A warm body has been recovered from the rubble of the collapsed building at First Avenue Banana Island, Ikoi, in Lagos. A Lagos State Emergency Management Agency worker's search and recovery efforts unearthed the remains of an adult male, hitherto unaccounted for by site supervisors. The excavation of the site using the architectural designs continues even as the site has been divided into quadrants for a painstaking search and rescue operation. Quadrants 2 and 3 have been leveled to ground zero with the search operation completed. A quadrant 4 is ongoing. 25 people were rescued from the site when the building went down on Wednesday and they are all doing fine. When the roll call was done by the site supervisors, everyone was accounted for. However, nobody could ascertain whether the victim whose body was found this morning was on the site as of the time the roll call was taken. Ahead of supplementary elections tomorrow, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has begun distribution of election materials across the states where the polls are being conducted. Our next report looks at the readiness of the electoral umpire to resolve hitches observed in the just-concluded 2023 general elections.
Attention is on the Independent National Electoral Commission again as it prepares for Saturday's supplementary election. The commission was unable to conduct elections amidst pockets of violence in some parts of Nigeria. Thus, Nigerians will be out in those areas to exercise their franchise. In the southern region of Nigeria, there will be supplementary elections in Akwaibom, Anambra, Bayausa, Edo, Imo, Rivers, and Eboin states. In River State, the Independent National Electoral Commissioner has dispatched sensitive electoral materials to affected areas amidst the brawl between party agents. <laughs> In Imo State, the commission hosted a stakeholders' meeting where the resident electoral officer calls on politicians in the state to allow the election process to take its course. The government of Ghana in Imo State uses this opportunity to plead with all stakeholders to allow this process to run without unnecessary interference and violence. We shall once again call you to come and observe the sensitive electoral materials to be used prior to their conveyance to the local materials involved. In Eboin, INEX has started the distribution of sensitive materials and promises a smooth exercise. So far, the, uh, what we call it, the beavers has been configured and charged. And all these materials have been sent to the local government areas where it's going to happen. So what, what I know, that the honorable resident electoral commissioner have done all the necessary, uh, uh, carry out all the necessary steps to ensure that this uh, uh, supplementary election will be effective and successful this coming Saturday. Ahead of Saturday's supplementary elections, Nigerians are watching keenly to see how INEC is addressing the flaws noticed during the presidential and National Assembly elections. Meanwhile, the Independent National Electoral Commission says, contrary to reports that the Commission has added more polling units for Saturday's supplementary polls in Adamawa State, voting will only take place in 69 polling units in 47 wards and 19 local government areas of the state. The resident electoral commissioner of INEC in the state, Mr. Hudu Yunusa Ari, confirmed this to journalists during the distribution of electoral materials at the state office of the commission in Yola. At hand to monitor the process are election observers and members of the state chapter of the Interparty Advisory Council, IPAC. It's few hours to the supplementary elections in Adamawa State, and the Independent National Electoral Commission is deploying electoral materials to the affected polling units. <laughs> Party agents, security personnel, and members of the civil society organizations are observing the process. The personnel of INEC takes time to explain to those present the procedures involved and items to be distributed. There have been concerns over an alleged plan by the Commission to increase the number of polling units for the supplementary polls, but the State Resident Electoral Commissioner, Mr. Huru Yunusa Ari, dismisses the allegations as he gives the number of polling units where voting will take place. In all, we have 69 uh, polling units to be contested. We have 36,935 uh, registered voters all over the state. And uh, all these states, if you, as you have, you have seen, we have the, the electoral officers are taking delivery of sensitive materials for their various uh, registration areas. All the security situation have been built up and uh, there, we don't have any much uh, uh, security threats. But uh, we call on all the people to come and mass and vote. After voting, you go back home. 
The leader of the Inter-Party Advisory Council and team lead of the Coalition of Civil Society Organizations covering the election gives their impression of the exercise. As you can see, they are distributing the materials. So, and we are there, we are checking one after the other. When each, uh, each local government, if they called, we we'll ask them to open it, we we'll see for ourselves before packing it. So I think uh, this time around there will be free, fair and credible election. The coalition of INEC and Radio Observer groups for this exercise, we are deploying about 153 observers in the state and they already said they are ready. Some of them have already gone to their deployment uh, basis for that exercise. All eyes are now on Adama State towards the transparent, free and credible supplementary elections. Still talking politics, the All Progressives Congress, APC, is holding its governorship primaries in Kogi, Bayelsa, as well as Imo states. In Bayelsa state, the direct primary started earlier this morning in 105 wards of the state. And because of the typography of the region, as at news time, the process is still underway. And reports by our correspondents say that the results will be announced tomorrow. In Kogi state, the primary started by 10 this morning and by 2 p.m. the exercise was over. Although, as at now, the result is yet to be announced officially. All well, the aspirants that contested the election are a former Auditor General, Local Government, Usman Ododo, Senator Smart Adiemi, a Deputy National Publicity, APC, Muritala Yako, a Deputy Governor, Edward Onoja, a Chief of Staff to the Governor, Mohamed Asuku, a State Accountant General, Jibrin Momo, and then the former Commissioner for Finance, Asiru Idris, who withdrew from the race. And in Imo State, Governor Hope Uzodima was the only candidate on the ballot. And after the exercise, he was announced the winner. The governor, who is seeking a second term, says he is satisfied with the process. The victory of today's event is a victory that is dedicated to God Almighty. And the victory that I'll cherish a long, long, long way. For me, I see it as a mark of confidence from the members of our great party and the entire Igbo people at large. Still ahead on the News at 10, Central Bank Governor Godwin MFLA to continue with his monetary policies as he renews efforts at curbing inflation. He was speaking today at the IMF World Bank Spring Meeting in Washington, D.C. That's in Business News. Join us again. Welcome back. Let's now head to the nation's capital where Markwe Ogun is standing by to give us the very latest at our Buja studios. Hello, Markwe. It's certainly good to see you, Ayo. Well, we're starting with a positive story. The Pension Transitional Arrangement Directorate, BITAD, has officially launched the I Am Alive platform, a web-based confirmation solution for verified pensioners. Addressing newsmen in Abuja, the Executive Secretary of PITAD, Dr. Choma Ejikeme, explains that the confirmation solution is designed to confirm if a pensioner is alive or dead. According to her, the directorate will continue to put in place programs that would improve the welfare of all pensioners under the scheme. Dr. Ejikeme maintained that mobile verification is still ongoing across the country, especially for the physically challenged and sick pensioners. PITAD has provided a six months grace period for every department and their pensioners to complete their IMF information. Kindly note that PITAD has trained pension desk officers from the ministries, departments, and agencies that our pensioners retired from, as well as the various representatives of pension units on the use of this application. And we believe and know that you will all assist the pensioners who are unable to carry out the confirmation of the 
our communication channels are also open to receive comments, observations, and render assistance when necessary. And we enjoy our pensioners to reach out to us. Multinational pharmaceutical and biotechnology company Pfizer is reinforcing its long-standing commitment to creating awareness about hemophilia, a rare bleeding disorder, while driving home the need for innovation in access to treatment. Pfizer says its goal is to make sure that patients living with hemophilia are seen, heard, and never forgotten as it continues to work tirelessly to find breakthrough solutions and therapeutic options to change their lives. The company made this commitment to commemorate this year's World Hemophilia Day, where a roundtable was held to highlight the issues. Some of those who spoke at the event dwelt on Pfizer's commitment to equity, emphasizing that its continued investment Treating hemophilia is evident in its more than 30 years of experience in developing therapies for hemato hematological disorders. According to them, people with hemophilia are at risk for excessive and recurrent bleeding from modest injuries, which have the potential to be life-threatening. Every day, members of staff at Pfizer work across developed and emerging markets to advance wellness, prevention, treatment, and cures that challenge the most feared diseases of our time. The company says it's consistent with its responsibility of, as one of the world's premier innovative biopharmaceutical companies and collaborates with healthcare providers, government and local communities to support and expand access to reliable, affordable healthcare around the world for more than 150 years. While staying with health issues, the World Health Organization and Yobe state government appear disturbed about what they term misinformation and disinformation when emergencies or disease outbreaks occur. The WHO and the Yobe state government spoke at a three-day training organized for journalists and social media influencers on behavioral change in Damaturu, the state capital. Well, that's all from Abuja Studios. It's back now to you, Ayo. Many thanks, Malkwe. Celtic, that's the situation today on the Lagos Ibado Expressway. It's indeed been long hours on the traffic for both exiting Lagos and those making their entry into the metropolis, a harrowing experience for commuters. Now the cause is the ongoing rehabilitation of the road by Julius Berger. But today's traffic began as early as 6 a.m. and as of now, it's still continuing. And this certainly is to warn that some of your loved ones who are on that axis may not get home as early as expected. Some civil society organizations under the banner of the Gender Strategy Advancement International is urging the incoming administration of President-elect Bola Tinubu to be more gender balanced in appointments into his cabinet. They are demanding greater opportunities for women as they believe the female folk have been largely or have largely been on the losing end in the governance process. Now the convener of the coalition and executive director of Gender Strategy Advancement International Adora Onyechere, who addressed a world press conference in Abuja, also says without women in positions of authority, the structural barriers against women like discriminatory laws, gender stereotypes and violence against women in politics will continue. When women are represented in political offices, they can advocate for policies that improve the lives of women and girls. They can push for gender sensitive policies and women in parliament and governance can also serve as role models for future generations of women inspiring them to pursue their goals. Furthermore, women's inclusion in political office is not just about gender equality. 
on the contrary. But it is also about good governance. Studies have shown that countries with higher levels of women's political participation tend to have lower levels of corruption, better social programs, and stronger democratic institutions. By including women in political offices, we are improving the quality of our governance and strengthening our democracy. But despite these benefits, women continue to face significant barriers when it comes to political participation in Nigeria. So the reason why we're here is that it is now up to all of us deliberately to work together to create a more inclusive society where women can participate in all aspects of public life. I call on the government and all institutions that reside within it to stop playing lip service to the inclusion of our Nigerian women in governance. A business news is up next with Anne Waldo. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Ayat Sunday. Hello and welcome to Business News. Central Bank Governor Godwin Emefile says the Apex Bank will continue to keep its eye on the country's inflation as a way of ensuring economic stability. Mr. Emefile, who was speaking on the sidelines of the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C., says the projections by IMF on the economy are indications that the fiscal and monetary policies recently introduced are capable of putting the country on the path of growth. I think I, I must say that uh, we're delighted that uh, even in the sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa, uh, growth, the growth levels in Nigeria, even though at our, at, at, by our assessment, is still sub-optimal, uh, that the IMF would, among all the countries in Africa, say that growth in Nigeria should be retained at 3.2%. Now things are hard. It means we're doing certain things that are correct and we'll continue to do those things that are right. Uh, but it also means that well, we're not going to remove our eyes on monetary policy, which is to focus extensively on how to um, moderate inflation, uh, but at the same time ensure that banking system stability remains resilient and then strong as it is right now. Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA, has been reacting to the International Monetary Fund's call to the federal government to increase taxes. NECA believes that any attempt to hike taxes will have a negative impact on households, individuals and even businesses. Also, the private sectors are overwhelmed by multiple taxes. The imposition of additional tax and services will make the business community more vulnerable with a trade-off and growth and job creation. The association now wants the government to support and ease their burden rather than considering any plan towards making them pay for its inefficiencies and fiscal discipline. After 12 consecutive weeks of decline, Nigeria's forex reserves saw a rebound this week. Data coming from the central bank shows the gross domestic uh, reserves increased slightly by $38.89 million this week to $35.43 billion as of April the 12th. Meanwhile, some analysts believe the FX liquidity issues will remain over the short to medium term, as there appears to be no positive signal indicating an improvement in forex supply when compared to pre-pandemic levels. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has raised concerns over the implementation of the deal, which allows the safe wartime export of grain from several Ukrainian Black Sea ports. In a letter to Russia, Ukraine and Turkey, Mr. Guterres says no ship had been inspected on Tuesday under this deal, agreed in July last year, as parties need more time to reach an agreement on operational issues. However, the UN maintains that it is now working in close collaboration with Turkey, to ensure continuation of the vital document. The agreement was brokered by the UN and Turkey to help tackle global food crisis worsened by the war in Ukraine.
And back here in Nigeria, let's head to the equities market. It ended the final trading session of negative territory. The color is red today. Investors are still selling big names ahead of inflation data report next week. Willy Bong has it. Welcome to the stock market report. It's the final trading day of the week, and the bear takes the win. <laughs> Some more sell-offs today, which lowered the all-share index by 0.08%. And Cadbury, which led the losers today, FBN Holdings, uh, Zenith Bank, weighed the market down. However, the banking index was up today in the green 0.10%. On the back of investors' interest in UBA, Access, and GTCO, now, UBA was the center of attention in today's trading session following its impressive fourth quarter 2023 earnings. And investors are rewarding the company by taking positions in that counter. Interestingly, the positive sentiments from UBA are filtered to other tier one banks like Access and GTCO, as investors believe these companies might replicate the same result as UBA. Now, Transco continues to enjoy impressive patronage from investors as its share price rose again today by 9.74% to close at 1 Naira 69 Kobo from its open of 1 Naira 54 Kobo. We're expecting inflation numbers from the MBS next week, and we'll see how investors react to this. And that's the stock market report. I'm Will Ibang. It's back to you. Thank you, Will. Let's see the closing numbers for other major markets around the world. That's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with IOTN Day. Have a wonderful weekend. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, many thanks, Anne. We're back to our story on healthcare in Yobe State, where we told you the W Health or the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, and indeed the Yobe State government, appear disturbed about what they term misinformation and disinformation when emergencies or disease outbreaks occur. Well, the WHO and the Yoba State government spoke at a three-day training organized for journalists and social media influencers on behavioral change reporting in Damaturu, the state capital. Over the years, the proliferation of fake news has been a major challenge, especially during disease outbreaks. This has threatened effective communication and the management of the outbreaks and has persisted despite warnings by the relevant authorities. To curb misinformation and disinformation in communities, over 30 journalists and social media influencers have been trained on behavioral change reporting. That information is not only about alien fears and anxieties, but it is also about encouraging social and behavioral change through communication. If you tell people that, okay, this is the right thing for you to do, we are now in the age of evidence-based medical practice. You cannot just wake up any moment, any day and just say, okay, there's an outbreak of this, and then somebody will now say, if you bath it, uh, salt water, it is okay. And in the meanwhile, what you do is probably to, to give social distance. The media uh, personnel are uh, key in uh, communicating the right information to the people, so that people comes to know when there is a threat and they should know signs and, de uh, and symptoms of a disease that can pose an uh, you know, outbreak. And then uh, they, they will know uh, the, the right thing they should do. They should report and they should take certain uh, you know, uh, uh, personal hygiene and precaution. Some of the participants describe the training as timely, especially now that most of the people draw their information and education from the social media space. Learn how we share information with regards to health emergencies. How do we report? How do we report that can protect our lives? And how do we uh, share information, factful information, and you know, dispel rumor and fake news around diseases? Uh, it enlightened and widened my understanding toward information sharing in social media and other media handles. It is believed that with the recent training, the challenge of publishing unverified information will be reduced to its barest minimum.
A Pentagon leak suspect Jack Teixeira has been charged with unauthorized retention and transmission of classified documents. The full complaint document filed by the U.S. government confirms that Jack Teixeira has held top security clearance since 2021 as part of his role in the Air National Guard. While Teixeira could be looking at 15 years in prison if found guilty on both counts. Here's Simon Puser with more on this and other international stories in Around the World in fun. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. A 21-year-old U.S. airman has appeared in court in connection with a leak of a highly classified military document about the Ukraine war and other national security issues. Here, video footage of Jack Tixera being arrested by FBI agents at his family home in Dighton, rural Massachusetts. Dressed in shorts and a T-shirt, he was led away by heavily armed agents. Mr. Tixera has been identified as the leader of an online chat group where the documents first emerged. Dozens of leaked documents revealed U.S. assessments of the war in Ukraine, as well as sensitive secrets about American allies, embarrassing Washington and raising fresh questions over the security of classified information. This was a deliberate criminal act, a violation of those guidelines. Uh, and so, again, I think that's important to understand. Now, we will continue to do everything we can to ensure that, that people who have a need to know uh, when it comes to this kind of information have access to that. U.S. President Joe Biden has returned to his roots in County Mayo on the final day of his visit to Ireland. The president spoke at a homecoming celebration outside St. Muradak's Cathedral in the town of Ballina, with a crowd of up to 20,000 people lining the streets of the town for the event. It's a day after he told the Irish Parliament he was home in an emotional address during the second day of the tour that celebrates his Irish heritage as he gears up for a planned 2024 re-election campaign. A powerful cyclone has hit Western Australia as a Category 5 storm, setting a wind speed record but sparing populated areas from major damage. Severe tropical cyclone Ilsa struck the state close to Port Hedland, the world's largest iron ore export hub, with the highest intensity rating on a 1 to 5 scale just before midnight. Emergency crews urged several remote communities along the storm's path to seek shelter and remain indoors. The cyclone was the strongest to hit the region in some 14 years. It's the first Category 5 system to make landfall in WA since 2009 and it's brought very destructive winds and heavy rain to an area between De Grey and Pardue Roadhouse. Fortunately, major population centres like Port Hedland and Bijadanga were spared the worst of the cyclone, and I've been told that early assessments in those areas show damage is fairly minimal. More footage from severe flooding in Florida has emerged after torrential downpours inundated the southeast of the state. Here, water rampaging through an underground car park as residents try desperately to save their vehicles. What the hell? Oh my God. They're stuck. Total rainfall in the Fort Lauderdale region rose to more than two feet in recent days, with widespread flooding that blocked roads, closed schools and shut down an airport. Some two million people in Browood County were under a flood warning as relentless rain hit the area. SpaceX has aborted the launch of Kenya's first Earth observation satellite due to bad weather. The launch director stopped the Falcon 9 rocket just 29 seconds before it blasted into space from the Vandenberg Force Base in California. Another attempt will be made on Saturday. And finally, the French president has visited the famous Parisian Notre Dame Cathedral four years after it suffered a major fire. Emmanuel Macron and his wife were given a tour of the cathedral and its restoration work. On the 15th of April 2019, a fire broke out in the roof space, exposing and destroying the exposed iron staples used to hold the cathedral's stone blocks together. Bravo à vous. 
Now, a smiling Macron applauded those working on restoring the famous building, its 80-ton wooden base resting on stone arches 30 meters above the heart of the cathedral is due to be completed on Saturday. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. The world of sports with 96 days to the FIFA Women's World Cup. The trophy tour hits new heights today in New York, unveiling the original winner's trophy on the 91st floor of what is billed as Midtown Manhattan's tallest skyscraper. The trophy, designed in 1998, is made up of gold-plated bronze and polished aluminum. It weighs 4.6 kilograms and stands 47 centimeters tall. Not only former World Cup winners and heads of state are permitted to touch and hold the trophy trophy. Quite frankly, a trophy tour is another step um, to get to the World Cup. So it's a moment of anticipation, of excitement. Um, and, and what a privilege, yeah, to work with FIFA and uh, to, to hold the trophy in again. And every time that I do, I'm uh, brought back to 2015 when we as a U.S. national team were able to win the World Cup. I think the U.S. team has a really good chance. I mean, obviously, they're ranked number one in FIFA rankings. They are still the team to beat. They're trying to do what has never been done before, and that's win three consecutive World Cups. That hasn't been done on the men's side or the women's side. So they have big goals. We always have big goals with the U.S. national team. Away from the World Cup, Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta says players must pull out all the stops and finish the job if they hope to fend off rivals Manchester City and win the club's first Premier League title since 2004. The leaders' seven-match winning run in the league allowed them to maintain their lead over second-place City. But a two-all draw at Liverpool last weekend has given their chasers a chance to increase the pressure on the Londoners. Now, Arsenal have a six-point lead over City, but Pep Guardiola's side have a game in hand. Meanwhile, Pep Guardiola has warned his Manchester City stars that a shock defeat against Leicester City on Saturday could end their hopes of winning the English Premier League title. Guardiola's side uh, holds second bottom Leicester City, knowing a victory would close the gap with leaders Arsenal to three points. Guardiola's side have coped well with heavy shadows in the past. He hopes they can use it to their advantage. And away from football, Holger Runa is through to the Monte Carlo Masters semi-finals after beating Daniel Medvedev 6-3, 6-4. In what was their first meeting on the ATP Tour, Runa overcame the number three seed who looked fatigued after a lengthy incident failed match with Alexander Zverev on Thursday evening. Now, after winning the quarterfinal clash in one hour and 17 minutes, Runa, whose career best result in Monte Carlo was the second round before this year, will play Janik Sina and the semi-finals of the competition. And for those of us here on the sports decks at this time, thanks indeed for watching. I am Kelly Egiga. It's back to you, Ayo. Many thanks, Kelly. And the main news again. The UNICEF, that's the United Nations Children's Fund, has expressed its worry over continued violation of rights of children nine years after 276 girls were abducted from Chibok Girls Secondary School in Borono State. And the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has begun the distribution of sensitive materials ahead of Saturday's supplementary elections. And that's the news at 10 tonight. Many thanks for watching. I'm Ayo Tunde Balukun. Have a good night.